Uh, many thanks, Henrique, many thanks um, to all, um, particularly to the platform for this space for further dialogue and collaboration. I have the feeling that I have been with you, uh, with many of you all over the week, uh, in your kitchens, in your bedrooms, in your studies and so on, and you might have the same feeling. So let me start by saying that um, since the beginning of the crisis, uh, we have been working uh, in HIC uh, on three main fronts. First, creation of spaces for dialogue and learning, trying to make sense of what this emergency means for the most vulnerable. Uh, second, and acknowledging that the crisis didn't come with a manual, we have been supporting, like many of you, exchanges and trying to document responses, local responses to the crisis. Last but not least, we have been trying to uh, focus on, obviously, on the advocacy and the mobilization required for radical changes, something that Claudia, Anna Claudia may refer, uh, refer to. Now, if we move to the next one. Okay. This uh, map that you are seeing shows many of the actions and being undertaken by uh, HIC members in response to uh, to the COVID crisis. I won't describe them here. You can, see, uh, you can see a link where you can get further details. But what I would like to do instead is to offer a cross reading of some key underlying principles that seem to inform many of these actions and similar ones taken by many of the organizations that are present in this meeting. Furthermore, I want to also focus on the ways in which the COVID-19 crisis has so far been predominantly framed and on how it should be reframed, particularly when considering its current and potential impacts on the human settlements, which are often referred to as slums, uh, unauthorized, precarious or informal. If we can go to the next one, Enrique. Uh, my first contention is that we need to move beyond blanket immunological assumptions. In, the less, uh, in less than a month and following the example of China, we have seen most Western governments adopting broadly similar approaches to tackling the COVID-19 pandemic. After initial hesitation, and I would say much gambling, they have enforced country-wide uh, lockdowns. Similar measures have been taken across Asia, Africa, and Latin America, and are growing a stricture by the day. But many of these protective measures are either impracticable for a large number of citizens or even pose further risk for them. The message I think is very clear here. Blanket immunological assumptions won't work for a vast majority of the world. For most people living in informal settlements, to stay at home is not an option, we know that neither a protective measure, but rather an additional risk. This is compounded by the risk of exposure posed by queuing to use shared toilets, draw water from wells or boreholes, or use crowded public transport. The large number of women, men, girls, and boys who live in informal settlements will be ill-served by measures that assume that home is a safe haven, that people can stockpile food, dig deep into their savings, or indeed be able to work from home. Next, COVID-19 has made visible how deep structural inequalities shape what being affected by the virus means, not only across different geographies, but also across intersecting class, race, gender, age, and ability. Over these past few weeks, we have read devastating accounts of how lockdown policies force many urban dwellers to choose between income and safety, between hunger and disease, between life, health, and livelihood. Running risk is part of their everyday lives. By contrast, this pandemic also highlights that national governments and the development sector are strongly risk averse. Donors provide support, uncertainty of delivery and predefined outputs and outcomes. Failure to deliver accordingly often means losing further support. This needs to change, as this approach offers very little room for learning by doing. So, what can we do differently to ensure that the shocks felt worldwide today, pay the way for long needed structural changes. Next, Henrique. If you can move to the next slide, Henrique. And the next one. Um, I would argue that a first uh, thing that uh, we can do differently is to put, measure, put numbers, sorry, to the unrecorded impacts of the crisis. Every day we wake up 
to the new updates on the number of people infected and lives claimed by the coronavirus worldwide. But we rarely see figures in the media on the number of people to be disproportionately affected due to pre-existing inequalities. We know that by 2018, there were already well over 1 billion people living in informal settlements. Similarly, we are aware of the shameful deficits worldwide, still preventing many from accessing safe water and sanitation. But we need to further disaggregate these figures and bring them to the fore to demand the level of resources, the level of changes that Anna Claudia was talking about, required to ensure that deep entrenched inequalities are tackled at once and for all. Next one. The second point I would like to highlight is that we also need to acknowledge that equal protection doesn't mean same protection. Blanket measures covering all informal settlements are likely to be uh, are likely to be ineffective. We know that the Peruvian barriada is very different to the slum in semi-rural Malawi. An informal settlement in Freetown is also different to a Turkish refugee camp. Obvious as this might sound, they require contextualized responses. Furthermore, if we can go to the next, let's not forget that women and girls are disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 crisis. Women represent 70% 70% of the health and social sector workforce globally. The current crisis is putting them at greater risk and requires special attention to their health and needs. Next one. Henrique. My third point is that we need to prevent stigmatization. Uh, raising awareness in informal settlements on how to avoid infection, what to do if you're infected, and how to care for others are critical tasks in contexts where public health care is large, largely absent. But while some messages like hand washing are uh, or might be universally relevant, particularly if you have access to water and soap, others need to be carefully considered to avoid discrimination and stigmatization. Think, for example, of what happened with early messages on HIV in Africa that created enormous stigma around those suspected of having the virus. This, in turn, made people more reluctant to be tested and helped the disease to spread more quickly. Next. The fourth point is clear also that protecting human rights should be at the center of pandemic and, and post-pandemic responses. We have all heard how lockdowns in Rwanda and India have already seen citizens killed by the police for breaking curfews. We have to remember that women and men living in informal settlements often have a very troubled relationship with the state institutions. The same applies, of course, to forced evictions, a matter I know will be discussed in detail by others later. Last but not least, we need to act now to address long view challenges. For the majority of people living in informal settlements, COVID-19 will be just one among the many health threats they face through their, throughout their lives. We need to put pressure on governments and the international community to stop so much nonsense. The nonsense of forced evictions as a means to de-densify and protect settlements. The nonsense of land and housing markets squeezing people to live in marginal environments and under high uh, tenure insecurity. The nonsense of living in a world where over 11% of the population still lack access to improved water supply and an estimated 25% lack access to adequate sanitation. The nonsense of commodified and wasteful food chains that condemn people to starvation and almost 11% of the world population to chronic undernourishment. The nonsense of ignoring gender inequality across all spheres of life and of course the list goes on and on. The main trial we face right now is not just about putting in motion the social protection measures required during the crisis. It is about tackling deep inequalities now and beyond the pandemic. The SDGs already spelled out the interconnected challenges to be addressed. They have been endorsed by 139 countries. Let's not forget that. But one thing is also clear. We cannot wait until 2030. I would like just to conclude to, by highlighting that the type of actions required means also recognizing that the social production of habitat that we are referring to is also the social production of health. Many thanks. Mm -hmm.